Okay, great. So, um, hello, good morning, and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Derek O'Halloran, and uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, to welcome you all, welcome you all here today. Um, I'm the uh, head of digital economy at the World Economic Forum, um, and I'm delighted to have this conversation, this opportunity to talk about a topic that, over the last two years, uh, I think through the pandemic, has really come into much sharper focus for a broad range of people across pretty much every country uh, and, and every walk of life. And that is the, the challenge of ensuring universal digital inclusion. Um, I think through the pandemic, many of us uh, realized how much we relied on digital and how much we could rely on digital in order to fulfill so many different areas of our lives. Uh, we were able to continue working. Many small businesses were able to stay in business. We were able to keep educating children. Uh, really, we relied on it for pretty much every aspect of our, of our lives. Um, however, this is not true for everybody. In fact, uh, today, still, 2.9 billion people, that's over one third of the world's population, do not enjoy the benefits that we all take for granted uh, with the internet. There has been some good news over the last two years. Uh, according to the latest information, the latest data, from the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. The 800 million people have joined uh, the internet over the last two years. And that's one of the biggest jumps we've seen in over a decade. So really, really great uh, uh, advancement, great news. However, still so much to be done. 2.9 billion, billion people, over a third of the world's population that really do not have today any opportunity to participate meaningfully in this increasingly digital society and economy that we are building uh, now at the beginning of this 21st century. This really is a, a many f see this issue as uh, fundamental to so, so many of our other goals. Many have called this uh, the SDG 18 or should be SDG 18 or maybe SDG zero because it, it uh, is one which would enable so many of the other goals that we want to try to achieve for an inclusive and sustainable uh, economy and society. In January of 2021, the World Economic Forum um, supported a committed group of organizations uh, to launch a coalition designed to tackle this challenge. It was called the Edison Alliance and spearheaded under the leadership of Hans Vestberg, the chief executive officer of Verizon. And if we look at what is the nature of this challenge, why is it that these 2.9 billion people are not connected? One of the first things we must understand is that 95% of these people actually live within range of 3G connectivity or better. 95%. So the challenge is not just one of infrastructure. Clearly, we need to work on the infrastructure for the 5%, but it's not just a challenge of infrastructure. So what are the gaps? The key gaps are the availability of services that are affordable and meaningful for people to be able to use. And addressing that challenge requires a cross-industry and private-public approach, a multi-stakeholder approach, so that we can build the partnerships to co-develop the solutions in order to bring these services uh, uh, to individuals around the world. The Alliance decided, rather than try and boil the ocean, to focus first on three critical areas where people would get the greatest benefit from digital connectivity. That is, namely, the three areas being digitally enabled services across financial inclusion, healthcare, and education. Uh, this is why the Alliance is comprised of 46 leaders across all of those sectors, as well as telecommunications, technology companies, investors, governments, and international organizations. I'm very, very happy to be joined uh, today by three of the uh, members, three of the leaders from the Edison Alliance uh, to talk a little bit more about the work that has been done to date and some of the work that we are launching uh, today. Um, one of the key pieces that we all said at the outset was that we wanted to make sure that we were very much focused on outcomes and one of the first things we said is that we would set ourselves ambitious targets and hold ourselves accountable to those targets. So in September of 2021, last September, 
we launched the One Billion Lives Challenge, which is an effort to uh, bring digitally enabled <coughs> services across healthcare, education and financial services to improve one billion lives uh, by 2025. We're going to hear more about that and the progress we've made against uh, that in, in just a moment, as well as two new areas, two new pillars uh, that will drive the collaboration and the work going forward uh, today. So to help uh, walk through uh, some of these elements, uh, I'm joined by uh, Rima Qureshi, um, the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President at Verizon and uh, Deputy to Hans Vesberg, the Chair uh, of Edison Alliance. Uh, Akim Steiner, the Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. And uh, our dear friend, uh, Minister Paula Ingebire, um, the uh, I Minister for ICT and Innovation for Rwanda. Um, Rima, perhaps I'll, I'll start with you. Um, could you tell us a little bit more, what is the One Billion Lives Challenge? And, uh, and how is it going? What progress is being made so far? Thank you, Derek, and um, very important initiative. So the One Billion Lives Challenge is uh, really to look at how we can create commercially viable solutions that impact and improve uh, one billion lives globally uh, with a focus on helping women. And um, as you mentioned, we started in January 2021. You could, we thought at the time that we were coming out of the pandemic and we were going to be focused on the areas that were most important that we felt that we really, it became, came to light during the pandemic. How do you get access to telemedicine? How do you have access to education remotely? And how do you have access for everyone for financial services? So that's why we focused on those focus areas. Our objective when we started the Alliance was to ensure that we had a small but impactful group of champions, as we call them. Uh, we started with 22 champions, and we have now more than doubled to 46 champions. As uh, Derek mentioned, we wanted to articulate exactly what was the purpose of the Edison Alliance. That's why we gave ourselves a target of one billion. In some respects, you could say it's a lot. In other respects, you could say it's not enough. But we want to make sure that when we say a billion, that we are able to measure and quantify that there are actually a billion people that have somehow been helped with the work that we are doing. Um, we have, since the launch of that One Billion Challenge, um, doubled the number of commitments that we have. So more than half of all of our 46 champions have made a commitment. And we will be announcing in September of this year where we are towards our overall target of reaching that One Billion. And one, one thing that we are very much focused on is each one of the champions that makes a commitment are also responsible for reporting, and we are focusing on ensuring that that reporting is taking us to that one billion challenge um, and removing wherever there may be overlap. So we are definitely on our way, uh, very much focused, and we would love to go beyond the one billion if we can, but we'll start by one billion and then we'll go from there. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, clearly the ultimate goal for all of us is that we achieve universal participation, affordable participation in the digital economy. So this is our, a contribution from, from a group. Um, can you describe a little bit what does it mean to make a commitment uh, for, for an organization? What it means to make a commitment is to focus specifically maybe in the area that you are working. So it could be geographically you are going to be focusing on helping, um, uh, for example, if you're going to do something with healthcare and you are in the healthcare space. So that, so that might be you are going to address uh, healthcare services for X number of million people in a particular geography. That could be an example of a commitment. It really depends on the type of company, <coughs> the type of business that you are in, and where you believe you can affect uh, that change. In general, most of our champions are looking at making commitments multi-year, and what we try to do is to track that progress specifically from when the Edison Alliance was launched. So we will not go back in time. We will only look at the commitments that have been made since January 2021 that are applicable in the areas that we are working on. And I think one of the key uh, reasons why we believe the World Economic Forum are the right uh, conveners for this is we are all here. 
and we are all represented, public, private, government, uh, NGOs, we are all here, and our objective is to make those links, is to create that enablement, because we all have a role to play. It's really how you bring people together, how you create examples of how it's been done elsewhere, and how you can use those examples towards uh, using similar principles in another geography or for a different field. That's, I think, what we will hear a little bit more about. So, so that is our objective. <coughs> and we want to be very concrete. We don't want to set, set, uh, put high-level targets that aspirationally we may not reach or it may take a longer period of time. So that's why we are limited in time, really focused on execution, and really focused on being able to demonstrate that we have actually improved lives. Great, thank you. Um, Akim, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you. And by the way, we'll, we'll have one round here and then I will open up for, for questions uh, from, from the audience uh, so we can have a little bit of a discussion uh, for the second half. But Akim, let me turn to you, if I may. Um, so Rima mentioned there about some of the ongoing work that is uh, taking place within organizations, both in the private sector, also in, in governments. We've seen, you know, in the process of those 800 million being added in over the last couple of years, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of innovation uh, that is taking place, both within the private sector and the public sector, uh, in order to enable people. But it feels very uh, scattered. There's an awful lot of great insight and resources available out there. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the Digital Inclusion Navigator, which you've helped to um, develop, co-develop along with BCG, uh, and what its purpose is and how it might be helpful for people? Sure, and good morning to all. I mean, just following up from uh, where Rima was speaking, I mean, all of us who, in a sense, uh, committed to working through this partnership, the Edison Alliance, obviously had to look for very practical and very direct ways of, of helping to accelerate what we observed during the pandemic, what we had, you know, in the years leading up to the pandemic already begun to recognize, namely, that digitalization, digital ecosystems were going to grow exponentially. And another way of, of, of describing you know, availability, accessibility, affordability is this term inclusive. So um, much of, as you have described, uh, what is happening in the world right now is an extraordinary amount of experimentation, um, innovation, introduction of new regulatory frameworks. And so in our discussions, we felt that, um, first of all, deliberate design for inclusion is not always necessarily an objective that is explicitly upfront, and yet we, you know, very much require both um, industry, uh, technology developers, but also governments, investors, to make it an explicit goal, because otherwise digitalization could create new and amplify inequalities. So, what's the shortcut to that? Well, the idea was, and this is where the, the WEF and BCG and UNDP um, essentially came together, is to simply create a platform, this digital inclusion navigator, where in the kind of one-stop shop, you can take a look at uh, what is actually being designed, where have the success stories emerged, and particularly to also recognize, you know, Paula will, I'm sure, speak to that uh, in a moment, when you have a government that has a deliberate policy, how does it actually implement that? What are the regulatory frameworks, the reforms? What are the incentives, and how do providers, how do the private sector, how do consumers respond? So um, today we um, are actually, you know, publicly launching uh, Digital Inclusion Navigator. You will find it on the Edison Alliance um, website. If you go to Edison Alliance web, uh, web um, you can find the link there. And it is really, um, you know, a, a constantly growing body of um, essentially demonstrated success stories, either in policy making, in design, in applications, or in a very deliberate way of, of giving expression to these notions of availability, accessibility, affordability, and I think hopefully will contribute to our ability to really, you know, make lives different for a billion people by, by working together. It can just be a shortcut, it can inspire others to follow, but it's also to celebrate very smart thinking that is happening across the world, and unfortunately it is a very diverse world, it's very dispersed, and our hope was that this accelerator would uh, in a sense, be a very convenient way to, to use. Great, excellent. So, yeah, it definitely seems like there is no one-size-fits-all. Uh, a lot of the easy wins have, have been gained, um, but being able to rapidly scale successes from innovations in different places uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is something we hope to achieve there. Excellent. Um, Paula, perhaps I'll, I'll 
turn to you then for um, a third pillar, um, a third leg to the stool here, if you will. Um, so Rima spoke about some of the global collaboration um, that has uh, been uh, that has emerged over the past 14 months through the uh, the convening of the champions. Um, but a lot of the innovation that Akim is talking about happens, of course, in countries, uh, and that's where the uh, that's where the progress, that's where the work is really done. Um, so today we're also launching the uh, the first wave of lighthouse countries. Could you share perhaps a little what are what are, we, what are the lighthouse countries, um, and uh, what do we hope to achieve? And tell us perhaps a little around uh, the first the first ones we are launching today. Uh, thanks, Derek. Good, good morning, everyone. And perhaps before. Um, I talk about the countries, maybe I'll also piggyback on what both Rima and Akim uh, shared. And, and true to the design of um, the Edison Alliance, uh, being a public-private partnership, it also means that governments um, you know, are also included in this. And so the idea of the Lighthouse uh, Network of Countries was really around finding those like-minded countries, those countries that have already, um, um, you know, and, and, and most countries do have uh, their digital inclusion agenda, but it's really how many of those, to, to Akim's point, have already put in place uh, the policies, the regulations that are willing to test and eager to test some of these new partnerships and new projects so that they can creatively close um, on the gaps that they have. Um, being able to, you know, willing to share information, but most importantly, because we're talking about a public-private partnership, also willing to put some skin in the game. Mm. Uh, because when you look at the extent of the challenges that we face and the sheer amount of resources required to, to really close on the gaps, you can't depend only on government financing or private sector financing. So it has to be a mix of these different uh, partners bringing together both the technical resources, the financial resources to really, and the ideas, what Kim was saying, to really uh, close on these gaps. And so we have a set of criteria uh, that has been put out and, and essentially what we also do is to encourage countries to express interest because uh, that's, we need them to show willingness to want to be part of this, uh, not just be a part of the Edison Alliance, but also part of really uh, closing on, on, on the digital inclusion gaps that they have um, within their jurisdictions. And secondly, uh, being able to share what the best practices have been, what hasn't worked also, because sometimes someone else may want to replicate what you have done and failed, but we, I think that's the whole idea of the digital inclusion navigator, to be able to say we've done 10 things, three of them worked, seven didn't work. And so that helps for the other countries that want to implement similar initiatives to really uh, not burn the same uh, circuits through the process. And so um, today we will be announcing uh, the first wave, like you mentioned, Derek, uh, of uh, lighthouse countries, uh, Bangladesh, Bahrain, and Rwanda. And starting with Bangladesh, uh, both Bangladesh and, and Bahrain are focused on um, education. Uh, Derek did mention the three focus areas, education, financial services, and healthcare. So um, for the two Bangladesh and, and, uh, and, and Bahrain, they're focused on uh, digital skilling, digital literacy, uh, ed tech uh, solutions uh, for students. Bangladesh specifically with a focus on women and girls um, in, in taking on STEM careers and uh, Bahrain with a focus on teachers. And, and the beauty about all of this is that you ha many, all of us, and, and the pandemic, uh, if there's one sector that has been largely disrupted is the education sector. So being able to have multiple countries that could be doing the same thing around uh, hybrid learning, around um, uh, you know, embracing digital technologies uh, to improve on the quality of education, I think will allow for those learnings to be shared across the board. Third uh, is Rwanda. And we're focused on cashless, driving uh, d uh, financial inclusion through uh, digital payments. And um, our target, uh, and, and the pandemic again, has been a good eye-opening experience. The very first uh, four months uh, of going through the pandemic, we had tenfold uh, 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 digital payments transactions happening. So we saw a clear shift from... Um, uh, for, from uh, heavily cash-based uh, ways of transacting um, to digital uh, financial payments, but largely through the mobile phone. And, mm. and so that's also um, uh, um, you know, a best practice that can be shared. What triggered that? Was it the lowering um, of transaction fees? How do you sustain that going forward? And so these are some of the things that we look forward uh, to sharing. The other one that we'll be focused on is digital skilling uh, for our citizens, where we have a target over the next two years to at least skill 5 million citizens uh, by 2024. And, and, and that's a target um, that, that is really, again, going to uh, require 
a lot of partnerships uh, across the board to be able um, to close the gap. So going forward, even as we announce this uh, first wave of lighthouse countries, um, we have a long list of many other countries that are joining the network that we will be announcing progressively. But again, to Rima's point, we need to see impact and impact that is happening immediately so that we can quickly understand what needs to change, but how do we close on the gaps as soon as possible. That's great. Thank you very much. And um, I think it's, uh, we, all, we all always watch Rwanda with admiration for the willingness to innovate and keep learning and learn, as you say, try 10 things, three of them work, take those, try the next 10 things. So um, I think it's been great to see that that has been driven forward over the last decade. And thank you for all of your work there. Um, I, will, I will open up to, um, to the uh, to the audience here um, for any questions that people may have. I see in the room some partners that are um, already actively involved, uh, as well as maybe some, some new folk who are hearing and learning about some of this for the, for the first time. Um, but maybe just before we, we, we go there, I'd like to maybe just come back a little bit on, on kind of the motivation. So um, Rima, maybe start with yourself. So Verizon is a US based uh, operator um so i mean what, what i mean isn't this a problem everywhere else why do you, you guys he care? says that as if it's a bad thing but, uh, <laughs> um the motivation okay so let, let's start with first of all this isn't a problem in africa or in asia this is a problem globally we have as many people or similar issues in the US as we have in other geographies. We have people who have access the way that we take for granted and what we needed to survive during the pandemic. And we have people literally sitting outside of a Starbucks or a public library because that's the only place they can get Wi-Fi connection. So this is a problem that we need to fix within the US as much as we need to fix it elsewhere. And Verizon is really committed to this. We have already spent over $3 billion on initiatives for digital inclusion. Uh, during the pandemic, we were very much focused on what we could do through the Verizon Foundation uh, on the education side and Verizon Innovative Learning, which we have been working on for a very long time, but with a, a, a greater focus to help those during um, the pandemic to ensure that they could study remotely. Through the Verizon Innovative Learning Program, we've helped 1.8 million children, and we are continuing to look at how we can help others uh, through STEM education and other areas. So it is a commitment. It is all of our responsibilities, and we all have something to contribute. So what we believe that we can contribute is uh, not only the fact that we are in the US, but the fact that we have a belief that we can help convene and help solve the problems that we have to solve ourselves in our geography, but we can help do that with others. One of the things that we talked about that Aki mentioned, there are three aspects. It's the usability, it's the accessibility, and it's the affordability. Uh, a lot of the people that need to be involved from an affordability perspective are people that we have to work with in our day job. And we can use that as our way of trying to bring those people together to solve these problems. So there is the benefit of the ecosystem that we are part of to help solve these problems for ourselves as well as globally. And also because we believe it is the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll just ask Akeem the same question. <laughs> UNDP, um, perhaps, you know, digital technologies maybe not be the first thing that people would think about if they think about UNDP traditionally. <laughs> um, again, maybe the same question to yourself. I hope I'm not getting myself into what trouble can here. I say? <laughs> How often people get things wrong in life, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I'm in the room here also with my colleague Doreen from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. I think, in all fairness, um, there are some who saw the advent of, of, you know, that digital universe already years ago, and they were part of enabling it to happen. I think what um, really began to make a development program of the United Nations, whose objective ultimately is about human development and how development can be inclusive and sustainable, was really um, the realization of quite how deep and how far digitalization was rapidly permeating every aspect of development in every part of the world. And so in the 2019 UNDP Human <coughs> Development Report, which is sort of the annual report about uh, where is development taking us? What is the frontier of thinking? 
Uh, two things, and it was the, the theme then was inequality. We were basically trying to unpack and understand how inequality is essentially either tackled and therefore enabling societies to advance or indeed uh, becoming a more pronounced problem, uh, polarizing societies and holding it back. And the two uh, variables that emerged there as really the ones over the next 10 to 20 years were interesting enough, digitalization and climate change, both carrying within themselves the greatest accelerator in terms of addressing inequality or, if not acted on appropriately, amplifying inequality. Mm -hmm. And that is the point at which um, you know, I, with my leadership team, took the decision to essentially take UNDP into a digital literacy exercise to first of all understand <coughs> what is it that um, development decision-making can influence and what do we learn from countries that have already embarked on that pathway successfully, unsuccessfully, but then really also understanding that our greatest contribution would be to help countries build a digital ecosystem. Because it's not just about fiber optic, it's not just about the number of people who have access, it's how do you work with the education sector so school leavers are actually able to enter a digital economy and find a place in there. How do you work with the financial system so the startup world, you know, the enterprises that are least likely to even be looked at by a bank traditionally would actually become the front line of where small scale investments, loans, um, financing would become available. And how could government ensure that, um, you know, along so many different trajectories, rural, urban, men and women, older people, younger people, these are all inequality lines that you can address with deliberate policy, deliberate investments. And this is why today, um, you know, we have a, an entire team in UNDP that is working with every other team in our country offices on essentially bringing that digitalization lens to achieving development outcomes. And I think in that sense, the same logic. First of all, not to do it would be foolish, given what is happening. Secondly, it's actually an enormous opportunity. Thank you. Well, well now, now I am much better informed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but two, two of the areas that you mentioned there are really, uh, I think, important themes that have come through all of our work. Uh, I think one being the that point around, even though we've had all of the uh, great addition in terms of numbers to the internet, in fact, the more people that are connected and the more services become digital, it exacerbates the divide for those that are not connected. Yeah. And then second, the point around um, it being uh, digital uh, availability or adoption mm -hmm. in one part of a community or ecosystem being an amplifier or a catalyst that then has a lot of second order, third order, of order effects for, for businesses. And, and community. So let's. I have a different question for you, Paula, because I know um, the motivation question is a little different. <laughs> mm -hmm. As the minister, it's <laughs> kind of your job. So <laughs> well, I have a different question for you. But let's sure. go to the room first. Um, Barry, please go ahead. So um, we'll, we'll oh, just take the microphone there. Hi, ba Barry French from Inmar Sad, and uh, first of all, congratulations on the great Edison work. And we are pleased to announce our commitments. I guess two weeks ago, yeah. and. It, I love the discipline and the focus on execution because that, that's really great. Um, I have what may be a slightly controversial question to ask, and, and Derek's already gotten himself in trouble, so I'm going to now get myself in, <laughs> in trouble as well. Um, I think we all look at this connectivity and say there's a social good here, um, which is true, and, and I don't doubt it for a second. You know, in 99.9999 whatever cases, it's a good. But... There are also times when all this connectivity in the wrong hands can be used the wrong way. And you know, I experienced it when I was with Nokia um, and we had some issues in Iran where you know, telecom equipment was used to target dissidents and activists and ended up doing bad things. And I guess I'd just ask all of you, um, or whoever wants to take it, is how do you think about this issue when you bring on all these new people in, term, in connectivity? How do you think about that to ensure that what we do is a good for human rights and is not used to oppress human rights. Great. So how, how do we ensure we're not being too techno-optimist here and we're having a balance? Who, who wants to take a... I'm happy to just give please, a quick yeah. response because there is a very, very obvious response there, and that is if you don't pay attention to it, you will exactly enable, um, as with any technology, those who want to manipulate it or to use it um, either to their own financial advantage at the expense of others or indeed much deeper fundamental human rights issues. And it's very interesting when the Secretary General um, you know, invited a group of leaders to advise him on how to 
look at digital cooperation in the future, there was a very poignant sentence in there, and I think it speaks exactly to what you are alluding to, which is there is a strange assumption almost uh, with the advent of digital and, and you know, all that has come with it, that um, you know, almost 75 years of developing fundamental human rights, protection of data, citizens' rights, and so on, in, in an analog world, ceases to somehow be relevant in the digital world, which is a, a very dangerous uh, assumption. Remember, the less restriction states should not interfere in the internet and so on. No, I mean, you, you know, citizens today are affected in their fundamental exercise of their rights, but actually also uh, in the protection of their rights and protection of citizens. And I think we are struggling to keep up with uh, where this is. The other dimension is cybercrime. I mean, we are today in, a, in an era where cyber warfare becomes the next form of, um, of military uh, combat, so to speak, but in a, in a digital sense. So again, I think we, we are extremely concerned in the United Nations um, and uh, are looking with a great deal of attention to where is the scope to create an international framework here that just like we have for other forms of conflict, strange as it sounds. I mean, we, we have to find rules uh, for war. It's the sad, sad tragedy of human condition. But um, I think that sphere that you're alluding to is absolutely part of that and uh, probably becoming the greatest single new threat for which there is very little right now uh, to, to deal with. I'll stop here. So maybe just to, to add on that, I think just like anything, there's always the benefits and risks that come with it. Um, I like to use the example of driving while, you know, cars were put to ease mobility, but if not used well, it results into death, right? So even when we're talking about um, the digital space, it's the same. And, and that's partly why uh, in many cases, even as governments, you have regulations to start with because it's meant to look at what could be the worst case scenario of what was intended to be a good thing, not actually resulting into a good thing. There's also the unintended consequences that sometimes we're not very much aware of from the onset when we're designing some of these initiatives. But um, what you'll typically see across the board and largely uh, across government is that there's also an effort to sensitize, create awareness, because you also know that even when you provide this you know, public good in the hands of the people, it may not necessarily be used uh, for the right things uh, all the time. And so how do you create that awareness? How do you sensitize? But also how do you put in place the checks and balances that are required um, to safeguard and protect um, those that are, that, that are using it? Um, I want to give a practical example. I remember when uh, we were putting in a lot of effort to drive digital financial inclusion, so we saw a lot of fraud coming with that. While you have more and more people that uh, have easy access to financial services, you still had a bunch of people who were using the same tools um, uh, to con uh, citizens. And so, again, and, and I think this is the beauty about the digital landscape, is that changes are constant. So you're constantly evolving, understanding what are the new forms of threats and risks that are emerging, and then also designing for those. So when we talk about privacy by design, security by design, it's exactly uh, to take care of some of those concerns. Great. I have a lot to say on this. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I have been working in this industry or related industries for over 30 years. And when the with the advent of the phone, there was a belief initially that there would be hundreds, not billions. Imagine your life today without a phone. And yes, there are risks, but think of all of the benefits and think of all of the things that we would not be able to do. And I believe the net of all of the risks is still an overall benefit for all of the things that it would enable. And we can just look at the pandemic. We were talking about that over uh, a dinner last night. Could you have even gotten a vaccine or scheduled a vaccine if you weren't able to go online to know where to go and actually book it? So there are basic things that are so fundamental that would not be possible unless you are part of the, the ecosystem. There are risks and we have to be careful of those risks. But ultimately, I think GDP is impacted when you have more people online, literacy, the ability to bring everybody along uh, instead of those that can afford it. Um, overall, 
it is much better to have people and be aware of those benefit uh, risks and to to deal with them as best as we can than to leave people off. Yeah. It's way, way outweigh the risk, but it's good to hear that Great. I think yeah. the term yeah. is really the proactive. I think, you know, for too long, we observed this as a sphere in which maybe other rules would apply. And I think this was a, a, a problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe the um, gentleman in the second row first, and then uh, Pamela, we come to you. Uh, my name is George Vredenberg. I'm chairman of the board of the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. One branch of what we're going to do uh, is to digitally, cognitively assess the world's population. So I'd love to talk to you about how whether or not our work may join with your work to extend the digitalization uh, to the solutions of the brain diseases. Oops, I'm going to take a personal note here. I was at AOL. The first time I came to Davos was 20 years ago with Steve Case and AOL to try and persuade the world that the Internet was a good thing. <laughs> uh, before cell phones, before there was any of this, uh, we coined the digital divide as a problem in the United States because it wasn't accessible. We had problems of child pornography, how to control that. We had problems of copyright violation, how to control that. How are we going to protect people who put their credit cards online because they didn't want to use and put credit cards online? Could you imagine <coughs> never putting credit cards online today? <laughs> uh, so you basically taken the debate that we had domestically 20 years ago uh, to try and weigh values and, and, and downsides and taking it global. So I cannot say enough about how impressed I am by this alliance to try and take all of these problems and tackle them at a global level. I think the net benefit of the internet to the world has been extraordinary. It has been misused by governments, mm -hmm. by cyber criminals, uh, but nevertheless, the net balance has been terrific. And so I congratulate you on this alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, would you mind passing it just there? Pam Reeve from American Tower, and I'm so proud that we are part of the Edison Alliance with our commitment to 2,000 digital communities by 2025. You asked why companies engage with this, and I just wanted to add to Rima's wonderful comments. We operate in many underdeveloped countries around the world or emerging economies around the world, and we want their economic development, and we want that development to be spread broadly. We need a skilled workforce and a healthy workforce in those environments. We want political stability in those environments. So it's good for our business. It's good for us to do it. But we also think it's a moral imperative. And as Zakim just said, life is impossible uh, without access to the internet. What I wondered if some of you might address, and I'm looking at you, Paula, because I know <laughs> you've done so much of this in Rwanda. For us to succeed in the one billion uh, uh, connectivity affected, not just connected, uh, population by 2025. I think this is going to take an unprecedented level of partnership at all levels from companies, quasis, uh, nonprofits, and governments, probably the likes of which we've never seen before. More collaborative, more creative, dare I say, more uh, innovative and flexible. Uh, than we've seen before. And I wonder, since you've had so much success in Rwanda, if you might give the audience here an example of that that we can see in the future. We know for our digital communities that's an absolute requirement. Great. Um, and I'm trying to think which would be the best example to <laughs> use. But um, maybe just starting off by, um, it's one thing to have the financial resources, whether it's the money that is going to be you know, uh, put together from private sector and governments, but it's another thing uh, to think through the processes, the regulations that need to unlock this access usage and, and affordability. And I think that's where, uh, and, uh, and, and that's where the, the biggest pain point is in many times, is that um, many countries' regulations haven't caught up with the rate of innovation, with the rate at which technology is going. And the lack of that almost means that something that could take you a year or two to happen could take you another 10 years because you're still stuck on very archaic regulations that are not relevant to the challenges that you're trying to, um, uh, to solve for. And so even for us as governments, even as we launched the Lighthouse um, um, uh, Network of Countries, it's, it's really uh, being able to allow ourselves to take the risk um, of, of, uh, of, 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 you know, breaking up some of these regulations and figuring out what, what you know, how, how is this going to happen? Just picking an example about um, 
and, and Derek knows because we worked very closely with the forum, we were trying to put in place our data protection and privacy law. We, we were one of a few African countries that have already put one in place. And just like many countries on, in the world, not just in Africa, a lot of them were benchmarking the GDPR. Now, is it convenient for our local context? Are there sticky issues globally that no one has sort of figured out? What do we do with that? And so things like um, hosting data in country, does that make sense? Does that help with you know, multinational companies? Because it would mean that every jurisdiction that you're in, you have to put a data center or some sort of facility yeah. because everyone wants to keep the data in country. What could be the alternatives? Could we think about um, you know, approaches like whitelisting, if I can pick, 50 countries that have similar regulations at par with how we protect uh, personal data uh, use, usage, how can that be done? And so I would allow for many countries to be able to host my data. Can we think about data embassies? And so some of these things require that, that, that you really um, you know, uh, break the norm and, and try and figure out what makes sense uh, for you to be able to be ahead. Because you can't leapfrog, you can't stay ahead of technology if you're still bogged down by regulations and policies that are not necessarily um, at par with where you are. And we've had our fair share of challenges, by the way. We've learned through many of these where we've put in place regulations and policies. They've worked for the first two to five years after that. It, they just don't work. And so we've had to say, do we get stuck on a decision we made five years ago? Or do we just go ahead and, and figure out what mm -hmm. makes sense? And so it's that agility that is required because I feel many times uh, that's what bogs down implementation and progress. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we are running um, out of time here, so we're going to wrap up in two to three minutes. Perhaps I'll do one uh, lightning round uh, of maybe a tweet uh, length uh, thought to, to leave with the, with the audience. Um, I think we've heard uh, about the three pillars that we're building uh, across the Edison Alliance with commitments, concrete commitments towards a defined target, a, a platform to enable the acceleration of shared learnings and the dissemination of successes, uh, and then the, the focal points in lighthouse countries where we can actually bring the, the partnerships together. We've learned that we need to uh, be confident that the benefits set the risks, but we need to consciously manage those risks through the explicit acknowledgement of, of principles and the conscious incorporation of those into uh, the design of um, regulations and policies. Um, and I think, as you articulated very well, the combination of resources, partnerships, regulation, thinking through uh, the, the, the processes of all of the things that are needed, but most important, uh, staying agile. Now, I know I went longer than a tweet, but that was to give you guys the time to that think of email. something. Yeah, that, that was an email. email. <laughs> that was a too long, didn't read email. Uh, but that was to give you time to uh, come up with your tweet. So, Rima, I'm going to start with you. Um, lots of different initiatives out there. The objective of the Alliance is really to look at how we can combine them to solve the problems that we are all looking at it. We uh, looking at. We are all in this together, and I think we're all part of the solution. I don't think that was 140 characters, but it's not an email. I believe Elon is looking at extending right. the like, tweets. Thank you. So, um, abbreviation ICMYT, or in case you missed it, at web hashtag Edison Alliance. There Come you go. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I don't think you I said can the UNDP that. wasn't digital, right? I know. <laughs> this is a I don't think I can match that, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> Well, exciting partnerships, um, to exciting partnerships today, um, tackling digital inclusion at the core. Excellent. Great. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.